today's episode, we're going to talk about China's engagement in Latin America and its implication to Europe. I'm glad to welcome two distinguished guests. Firstly, let me introduce Daniel Agramo, a former diplomat from the Bolivian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and currently a researcher at the University of Frankfurt. Daniel is also the author of a recent CAS study titled China Security and Military Cooperation in Latin America and the Caribbean Implications for Europe. Welcome, Daniel. As a second speaker, I am uh, happy to greet Johannes Hugel, one of our own, who is joining us from the CAS Latin America team in, in Berlin. Johannes is in charge of the Andean countries, as well as cross-cutting themes like the influence of China in the region. Welcome, Johannes. Thank you. Daniel, let me start with you. Why has uh, China's engagement increased in Latin America? We, we read about it a lot in the newspaper. It's China's increased presence in Latin America is a huge phenomenon. It's often referred to as El Desembarco Chino, as, as a book I wrote three years ago. And this Chinese arrival makes reference to the huge increase in economic flows. From four decades of mostly uh, so buying only a few commodities, China's new presence in the world, with the accession to WTO in 2001, increased its presence in the peripheries in the global south, and Latin America especially, buying uh, more and more commodities. But then in this, these two past decades, it came also with an increase in the exports from China to the region, from low-tech goods to medium and also high-tech goods, even displacing uh, the regional production. I mean, Brazil is buying more and more from China than from Mercosur. Argentina is buying more from China than from Mercosur, and the Andean countries. So uh, even the U.S. was displaced from South America, while most Central American nations still trade more with the U.S. South America is trading more with China. And also this has been accompanied with uh, investment, a lot of FDI coming from China, loans, cooperation, and political relations. China has been accompanied this with high-ranked diplomats, uh, presidential visits, more than than Western countries, more than Europe. Uh, a lot of Latin American presidents have gone to China in this past decade. And also Xi Jinping has showed interest uh, in the region and, and with a lot of officers. So we can say that China is the new player in town. China is the new partner. And while Europe is, is sending signals of retreat, uh, European nations are closing embassies, are reducing cooperation. The Chinese discourse is that Latin America is one of the most important regions in the world for them. So they are uh, showing that the billions in cooperation are going to be increased. Well, data is showing that bilateral loans have decreased. But the discourse is that they will give more money, they will transfer more technology because uh, Latin America is so important because they are a South, just like Latin America, and Southern nations should cooperate. You mentioned a couple of countries now here, um, Latin America and the Caribbean, of course, it's a big area. Uh, I guess there are differences as well within countries. Um, in your research, have you found out some tendencies uh, with which countries does China cooperate more and why is it like that? Yes. Uh, we have divided Latin American countries into three groups according to their relation with China. The first group is the ones that uh, want to deepen ties with China. Mostly uh, those are countries that overtly uh, are against U.S. policies in the region. They consider themselves anti-imperialist. So China is the obvious partner, uh, not only for trade, but also for political relations. The second group uh, is countries that are in the middle, pragmatic countries, which have fluid relations with the U.S., but also have increased their relations with China. And the third group are the countries that don't have official diplomatic relations with China. This, this group is decreasing. China has managed to turn four Central American nations in these past two decades to recognize China instead of uh, Taiwan. But turning to the other two groups, the interesting thing is that uh, whether they have good relations with the U.S. or bad relations with the U.S., they all have good relations with China. China has friends in the region. China is not interested in enforcing them to choose, 
in uh, in trying to promote its ideology, like the Mao days. China says a uh, so respect to sovereignty as the first principle. So if you are left wing government, we can have good relations. If you are right wing government, we also can have good relations. You mentioned a couple of uh, categories of countries, also depending on the uh, on the feeling how they have on the U- United States or what's the, what what stand they have towards the United States or maybe the West in more general. I, I would like to turn with this uh, remark to to Johannes. Uh, currently, we have seen. Uh, div- the deeper division uh, on the basis uh, of the war in Ukraine. So, for example, if you look at the UN Security Council, some countries have uh, voted uh, to condemn the attack uh, on Ukraine, some countries not. Most of the Latin American countries have been more on the Western uh, side on this. What what kind of um, repercussions does this mean? That w- w- why, why are they doing this? Yeah, thank you. I think, first of all, we have to note and um, that the Latin American countries, as you said, mainly voted against this war, um, which is, is it's remarkable because it's still one of the most democratic regions in the world that we have. Um, and, for that, and for that reason also Europe should be interested in these countries. But the Ukraine war will definitely have an impact uh, on the region. We see that in terms of food security and energy security, um, but also in business relations because there are tendencies to the a process of deglobalization and decoupling that could come up which have um, some risk for countries in their relations uh, business-wise and for others opportunities like Mexico um, may have opportunities out of that but other countries in the Andean countries they will lose definitely from that. In terms of food security we see for example that um, with the lack of um, fertilizers coming from Russia or uh, with the lack of um, wheat coming from the Ukraine, countries will have problems in their agricultural sectors. Peru is an example. They had um, uh, declared um, an emergency case on the, f- and the food and agricultural sector because of the crisis in Ukraine. So some uh, countries are very much worried. Another um, example is Ecuador. Um, it's a banana producer and 25% of its exports of bananas normally go to Russia. But now this is not possible any longer. So they ask also for help to the European Union or other partners, give us an opportunity where we can export. Mm. So there are definitely impacts, as I told. And um, I think in the future there will be more, even more um, challenges coming up with that situation. Uh, Europe here as well as an export market now for, in, in Peru's case, I would like to ask a general question. What is this increased Chinese involvement or influence in, in Latin America combined with uh, what we just heard, the implications of the, the war, current war in Ukraine? What does this all mean to Europe? Um, I would like to go with you, Daniel, first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was talking about ch- uh, Chinese pragmatism in the region. And uh, Johannes mentioned the, the voting, in, in the UN in several votings, against or, or for Russia. And it's it's quite funny how the, the voting changed. First, Bolsonaro had a, a position. Now, Argentina also, since yesterday they started calling it a war. But in Brazilian case, the, the U.S. and Biden's administrations were full enough to lose Brazil, just precisely because of ideology. While China's pragmatism in, in the region is working. Now, for example, Brazil is sticking together with BRICS, not condemning... A, Russia trying to stay in the middle, even India trying to find ways to to keep on trading without dollars. So not the position in the region is mostly against, I would say. Okay, but now what, what does China have to say in this? All Latin American countries, for what I see, they don't want to have bad relations with China. So in this case, it's, it's condemning Russia, okay. But we just keep wondering, what is China going to say? What does China have to say in this? A lot of experts say China uh, has an interest in undermining the liberal world order. Yes, but up to a certain point, uh, if the crisis, if the economic crisis gets too hard, China is going to intervene. Well, until now, they have, have only said that like, they're in the middle, but a lot of government officials are repeating Russia's position, that it's NATO's fault, and now they have the support of BRICS. So uh, for the region, given this economic crisis in agricultural crisis that is going to come, as Johannes said, I think China is going to be a big player. If the U.S. 
or the European Union don't have a, a more active position, like there is going to be a lack of wheat, a lack of oil, uh, uh, impacting hardly the poor in South America. And what I can see is China coming to the rescue, just like with the vaccines. I will take this um, this this point also to ask you, Johannes. So uh, we mentioned here European engagement and, and Chinese influence uh, growing. For example, Europe has traditionally engaged with China through trade. So there's many trade agreements with most of the countries, but there are also problems. Uh, the free trade agreement in Mercosur, for example, or with uh, Chile and, and Mexico. What's the European approach to to Latin America, uh, and maybe how should it change? Uh, according to this new situation. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think it, it's very important, first of all, to say that there is the possibility for Europe and also for the United States of losing a long-standing partner, especially a long-standing partner in values, uh, democracy, rule of law, etc. And if, um, well, the European Union should change, actually, also their approach to the countries, as we have seen, the Chinese, they come as a South-South global partner, they say you're an equal partner for us, and they try to satisfy the needs that the Latin American countries have, while the European Union or the United States, when they do um, donate or have uh, business relations and development policies-wise um, relations, have conditionalities. And with a lot of conditionalities, the countries have problems. And that's why it's easy for China to enter here. But I also wanted to mention um, the opportunities that are still there for the countries, um, economically-wise, as we see, for example, the Argentinian, present, uh, Argentinian president at the moment being in Spain and com also coming to Germany, offering new relationship of, um, of hydrogen cooperation with Germany yeah, in this situation of war as a consequence of that. The question is if this is really a, a possibility since there is a huge lack of technical expertise in Argentina and in the Vaca de Muerte uh, region, you have to extract uh, the oil the, the, or the gas that is possibly uh, sent to, to Europe. And also the question for the Europeans, of course, with inflation in, in Argentina going up uh, to 80% in, in a year. So who is going to invest there? Hmm? So as I said before, there are opportunities, but there are also challenges. But um, Europe should definitely change their approach to Latin America um, business-wise and also their development, development policies-wise. Actually, uh, Daniel, you, you wrote in your uh, recent study and um, that Europe has been disengaging um, uh, with uh, Latin America. So how does a re-engagement of Europe with Latin America look like? Yes, it's, it's really complicated because you have to compete with China, China's pragmatism. And uh, as, as we spoke, European Union and Europe represents all these values, democracy, the first one. So it's not a pragmatism as a catch-all phrase, but what has to be changed, what I see in this new type of relation, is trying to imitate China's non-hierarchical relations. Even though the discourse in Europe, relations have been hierarchical, cooperation has been hierarchical, official development assistance, despite all the presidential declarations over the decades, was from top to down, uh, based on, on a modernization mentality that cannot be, cannot disappear. So, a more non-hierarchical relations, and uh, with this desperate cooperation that some country needs, like for example, like Johannes said, Ecuador or Argentina, it's a strong signal that after having reunions with Vladimir Putin, now Argentina's president decided to come to, to Europe, so, uh, of course, they are looking for cooperation, for money, desperate for money, but this can be seized. But my question is if the European Union as an institution can change this approach to non-hierarchical relations, and uh, which will mean a change in Western official development assistance <laughs> cooperation like for the past five decades, how it has been made. I actually, uh, European Union is, of course, a... Uh, uh, Many member states are represented there. So, for you, for you, uh, Johannes, um, coming from Berlin um, today to this this talk as well, what are your suggestions um, on Germany specifically as an engine of the European Union? 
Uh, we hear a lot in, in Brussels in discussions that uh, Latin America is in the focus much, of course, of the southern nations, Spain being one, the, one of the leaders in this. What needs to change that, that uh, other countries, uh, Germany included, uh, would be more engaged there? And in what areas? You mentioned oil, energy and one. Um, other suggestions? Yeah, first of all, I, I, I want to refer to what said Daniel about the, the complications to change the overall development policies. Um, with, with everything being uh, as it is. But I think it could be valuable to have concrete projects which would have a direct impact on the people's daily lives in, in Latin America. Maybe food security on the one hand side or job cre creation. But also I think what is very appealing for the countries is the Green Deal that the European Union started. Um, so circular economy or sustainability um, issues are very much appreciated in the country. But beforehand, of course, you have to have these concrete projects because people don't have the money, for example, to, to pay uh, the monthly rent for energy. So it would be important to have cheap energy solutions like solar power, wind power, hydrogen, um, which would give the countries an ability, um, on the one hand side, to show their people okay, you can have a good living and you have the energy. And then the other thing is um, in terms of connectivity, yeah, that the countries would uh, have the chance to bring to the rural areas that are quite disconnected from the big uh, cities that you would have their um, communication. I mean, you, you need the, the simple satellites there so that the mobile phone works. I think these could be concrete uh, projects with the European Union and especially Europe as a promoter of um, green economy, uh, could add uh, to these countries. And um, maybe also there could be uh, a change in the approach with the countries and so far that the, 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 the contracts become a bit more flexible um, so that they would be adjustable to the needs of the Latin American countries. It doesn't mean to have the big changes, but if a Latin American country has a problem at the moment, with some um, standards, you shouldn't be that hard. You'd say, okay, in the future, in five, ten years, we can contract this, you should apply with the standards. But for the beginning of the agreement, not. And I refer to that especially because of the Mercosur agreement that we are waiting for 20 years now to be um, finalized, and it has been criticized a lot. Um, but I think if you want to push forward with that, you also have to give the Latin American countries something, because the last time we didn't succeed I'm sorry to say, I, I believe it was because of the European Union eh? and France and Austria and Ireland that had their obstacles why they wouldn't like to have seen signed the contract. I would like to thank you both, uh, Daniel and, and Johannes, for taking part today in this discussion. Thank you. Uh, I think we could continue this, uh, but we do it at another time. Uh, dear listeners, thank you for tuning in to Bridging Voices. Mm -hmm.